joy to be with you and to worship with you. And it's a privilege to share God's word with you this morning. You probably have discovered this truth that in much of the writings of the Apostle Paul, we have the meat and potatoes of what the church believes. But one of the things that we often miss in the richness of Paul's writing is his prayers for the churches he established. In just about every church that Paul established in his three missionary journeys, he prays for each of those congregations. And the mark of a good Christian leader is not only to proclaim the gospel and to proclaim it with boldness, but also to pray with passion, with courage, and with the expectation that God hears prayers and God answers prayers. So I want to share with you one of those prayers. Some people refer to that as a benediction it could be a benediction is a prayer, a prayer could be a benediction, but in writing to the church in the city of Thessalonica, which is a thriving city in the northern part of Greece today, he establishes the church, and we could read about that in the 17th chapter of the book of Acts. And having established the church, he leaves and then he sends Timothy after a period of time to go and check on the status of the believers in Christ. And then he prays for them. And this is the prayer that he prays for them, which by extension is a prayer for you and for me is a prayer for the churches we all belong to and a prayer for the church at large in our country and around the world. This is the prayer. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 23 and 24. Now may the God of peace himself make you completely holy. May your complete spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus, the Messiah. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. There are wonderful truths in this short prayer for you and for me. The first one is the source or the object or the subject to whom Paul prays. He's not just praying to God in general. He's praying to a particular God who has a name, and a face, a identity, and a character. And he refers to this God to whom he is praying as the God of peace. Now normally when we think of the word peace, we assume that it is the absence of conflict, it's the absence of disharmony, It's the absence of disunity. And it is the presence of a wonderful established relationship between people. 
But the word that Paul uses for peace is not just the normal English word peace, the absence of conflict, the presence of something that is good in relationship, but he's using the word shalom, which is the richness of the entire Old Testament in that word. Everything about God is shalom. The face of God is the shalom of God. The name of God is the shalom of God. The acts of God is the shalom of God. It is the destruction of everything that is evil and that which disfaces people and that which defies God and that which destroys human relationship. Paul is praying that this God, who is the God of blessing upon blessing upon blessing, that this God, who is the God of grace upon grace upon God, on grace, this God, who is the God of righteousness upon righteousness upon righteousness, this God who gives gifts upon gifts upon gifts. It is this God to whom the Apostle Paul is praying, the Creator God, the covenant-keeping God, and the God who will come back again for his people in order to restore all things and all people to himself. It is this God to whom Paul is praying and saying, I want you, this God, to do who you are for your people. And one of the things we need to recapture again in these days of great catastrophe and brokenness, that God has our If the people who are affected by Elena should hear about the name of God, it is the God of Shalom. If the people in Israel and Palestine are to hear about something that is going to be life-giving in the midst of death, joy in the midst of sorrow, righteousness, in the midst of brokenness, they need to hear the name of God. If the church today needs to hear the name of God in all of our challenges that we face in the midst of humanism, in the midst of secularism, in the midst of defying God, the rebellion against God and God's people, it is the name of God. And so Paul is praying for these groups of Christians in Thessalonica. He's praying for you and for me. He says, I want you to know the God of peace. Isaiah talks about this God in the ninth and 11th chapter. He says, this is a mighty God, the Prince of Peace, the everlasting Father, and of his kingdom. And of his kingdom. The one who is in charge is the Shalom God. It is this kind of God the church needs to affirm constantly in the midst of it being splintered and broken. Jesus is not just Savior. He is more than Savior. He is Messiah. He is King of kings. He is Lord of lords. He is the Savior of Shalom. This God is our God. Awesome. Indescribable. And no matter what adjectives we might put together, he exhausts this God. And we need to recapture the God to whom we pray. The second thing that Paul says, you shalom God, I want you to do something special 
for your people. May the God of peace, here is the petition, and there are two petitions, make you completely holy in your spirit, in your soul, and your body, and also keep you. The word keep you means preserve you. Preserve you in the midst of all of the sickness and the sorrow and brokenness and loneliness. He wants God to keep us in the midst of the onslaught of evil. He wants the church to be kept. Pastor is praying that we would be a holy people. The word in Greek is the word sanctify. And it includes the big word salvation. The only answer to all the brokenness we have in our lives, to all the brokenness and splinter we have in the world today, in the midst of all the catastrophe, the only answer is not the government. Remember the words of Ronald Reagan, I'm from the government and I'm here to help you. It is not any other institution. It is not any other big shot. The only answer to all the catastrophe and unhappiness and sickness and woundedness and brokenness in the world today and in our lives, in our homes, in our families, in our churches, in our neighborhoods. I live right in the heart of Troy on 4th Avenue where there's almost shooting and robbery and all kinds of problems. And we are struggling as a parish as to how we could minister to the brokenness of families, the poverty of families. The only answer is not reformation. The only answer is transformation. The only answer is salvation, which means to offer to people the forgiveness of all their sins, that all their guilt has been taken and laid at the foot of the cross when Jesus died for the sin of all the world and took it on to himself. The only answer is salvation which is God gives to us himself in the gift of his Holy Spirit and it may have happened to you and to me and to others either at baptism or confirmation or when we were received into the church or maybe at some special meeting. The answer is ongoing grace of God in our lives. But notice, he is very particular in this work of salvation. He says, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved till the day of Jesus Christ. He wants us to know in our physical body that we are saved, that Jesus is Lord and that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, that our eyes will affirm that Jesus is Lord, that our ears will affirm that Jesus is Lord, that our speech will affirm that Jesus is Lord, that our acting with our hands and doing will affirm that Jesus is Lord, that our going out, our coming in, in all our journey, our travel, in sitting down, in recreation, in the totality of our body, we will know that Jesus is Lord. The salvation is for the total person, not just for the soul of people that your spirit and your soul and body kept blameless. That part of me that we cannot control, he wants 
Jesus to be Lord. And then he talks about the soul. It is that part of us that deals with our emotions, our pain, our pleasure, our affections. He wants the Lordship of Jesus Christ not to just be on the surface of our lives, but to go deep down in our very beings, in those memories where we are hurting, in those divisions we are fighting with, in those trauma kinds of situations that we still do not experience the full and complete forgiveness of God and know that we are made in God's image and that God loves us and God cares for us and God protects us even when we are almost like in the lion's den. Remember last time when I came, maybe or maybe time before, I preached about who do you want to be with you when you're in the lion's den and when the snow is falling? Sometimes life is like that almost every day. But deep down in my emotions, I know that my affections and my feelings, my pain and my pleasure, that Jesus Christ is Lord. He wants us to know like the Apostle Paul knew while he was beaten for the sake of the gospel and dragged from the hall of witness down into the barracks of a Roman prison that at midnight he can sing the songs of the grace of God. In his emotions he knew that even though when the lion was about to pounce upon him, and tear him to pieces that he sang. God is so good all the time, every time. That is the kind of gift God wants to give to us. And then in our spirit, which is that part of us that wants God's best for our lives, in terms of knowing his word, in terms of prayer, in terms of fasting, in terms of being filled with the Holy Spirit, in the disciplines of the Christian life, in the totality of my life, in the totality of the life of faith, in the completeness of the life of the church, he wants to sanctify us and make us whole and make us well and make us complete and be Lord. The word that helps me put all these things together is the word to be like Jesus. In my physical life, in my emotional life, and in my spiritual life. And that is the challenge. Jesus died on the cross, not just to forgive our sins and take away our guilt and fill us with his Holy Spirit and blunt the power of sin in our lives. But he has come and given all of himself so that we can be like him because one day we are going to see him face to face and he is preparing us to be that holy bride for that wonderful coronation that is to take place. And it doesn't begin then there thereafter. It begins here, now, today. Paul is also praying, not only that we will be like Jesus, but he also says, the second position, be kept like Jesus until he comes again. This is the prayer for hope in the midst of hopelessness. prayer for hope in the midst of hopelessness. Whether we have it going our way or not, whether all the I's are dotted or whether all the T's are crossed, whether people are for us or against us, while circumstances and history may be for us or against us, in all of these intangibles and exigencies of life that we will know that God 
is with us. May the God of peace sanctify us and keep us and preserve us so that Satan and evil will not defeat us and make us victims and captives to him and to his kind of lifestyle. But in the midst of all it, we will be more than conquerors. Not just a conqueror, but more than conquerors. The superlative degree in the English language, that we will be like Jesus. And so he's praying for you and for me, that we will be like Jesus, and we will have hope that cannot be defeated. How long is this? Notice the extent, the duration of this prayer until the coming of Jesus Christ. Not just for today on the 1st of October 2024, but next Monday and next Tuesday, even when we have all of these wonderful retreats and go beyond these retreats, even on the day of election and beyond the election, and whether the candidate you support or I support wins or not, but beyond the end of time, whether the war between Russia and Ukraine comes to an end, whether the conflict in the Middle East ends, but until the coming of Jesus Christ in the midst of all of the difficulties that could happen, or all the good and wonderful things that could happen, until that time, when the final trumpets will be blown and he returns as King of kings and Lord of lords, the prayer is he will keep us. He will keep you. He will keep me. He will keep the church. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Jesus talks about this in the 10th chapter of John. He said, you are in the center of my palm. And none, none can pluck you from me. If God be for us, who can be against us? Until the end of time. And then is there any guarantee that this prayer for you, for me, for the church will be answered? And Paul says, of course. It's not based on my faithfulness. He says in verse 24, the one who calls you is faithful. He will do it. The guarantee, oftentimes when you and I pray, or you and I bless, we wonder if our prayers go beyond the wall in which we are, the walls in the room in which we are. But here Paul says, I have confidence in this God of peace, I have confidence. I have absolute confidence. I have absolute, absolute, absolute confidence that he who is who he says he is will do it. It's based on the character of God. It's based on the acts of God, of what he has done, what he is doing, and what he will do, it will be answered. What do you want God to do for you today, my friend? May the God of peace make us like Jesus. May the God of shalom keep us and preserve us until the day of his coming and trusting in him and in his faithfulness he will do it the only thing you and I have to do is offer ourselves our body our emotions our spirit to him and say I want you to be Lord. Lord of myself, Lord of my family, Lord of all my relationships, 
Lord of my church, Lord of my diocese, Lord of my neighborhood, Lord of my state. I want you to be Lord of my country. I want your kingdom to come on earth. Not in heaven. It's already been done. And so, Paul says, the kingdom will come. And it begins with you, with me, with the church. May you and I make this our passion and our prayer and our practice daily in our lives. Would you just bow your head in a moment of prayer? In your faithfulness, God of peace, answer your prayer for us. Today, each day, and until Jesus Christ returns. In his name and for his sake we pray with thanksgiving and with confidence that you hear us and answer us. Amen and amen.